Well, hey friends, welcome to Awakenings Ask a Scholar podcast. This is where you, the everyday Christian, can get your questions about the Bible answered by a biblical scholar. I'm Carla. And I'm Mike, and we're both glad that you decided to join our discussion. So let's dive in. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to jump in and discuss your questions on the books of Joshua and Judges. And today with us, we have two scholars plus Mike Chu. So you're gonna get a lot of really great discussion and, and, and back and forth on your questions. And so I just wanna introduce quickly Dr. Matthew Lynch and Dr. Michelle Knight. Thank you so much for being with us today. Great to be here. Yeah, well, why don't so you guys? Why don't you guys each take just about a minute or so just to say who you are? I would, I'd love for you to tell the viewers what your um, areas of study are and what you're really passionate about. So um, let me, so that you're not talking over each other, Dr. Lynch. Why don't you go first? <laughs> okay, sure. Um, yeah, thanks for having me here. Uh, so my name's Matt, and I uh, got into biblical studies initially. When after spending a semester in Israel back in the late 90s, I spent a semester at Jerusalem University College. And and after studying there, I just thought, wow, this is what I want to. I have so many questions after being here and about early Judaism and its relationship to Christianity and the place of the Old Testament. And ultimately, I ended up pursuing Old Testament studies and my master's studies at Regent College and then PhD work at Emory. And um, I think what drew me to the Old Testament is the need that I saw in the church for a deeper understanding and engagement with the Old Testament, and just a sense of like people thinking, I know this is important, but I don't know what to do with it. And, and also the breadth that I saw in the Old Testament of you know, being able to grapple with long periods of disappointment with God that the Old Testament gives space to, um, mm -hmm. that the diverse kinds of literature that you have there, diverse perspectives, and and feeling like there's a lot of breathing space in the Old Testament. That's such a gift, and the church often was not able to to access it well. So that's that's sort of what got me into it. And then my my research has ended up focusing in the areas of the subject of violence in the Old Testament. And so I've written on that. And then also I've done a lot of work in the book of Isaiah. And so I'm writing a commentary on that right now. So my, my research, a lot of my research focus is oriented that way uh, at the moment. And, and I've come to those subjects sort of from different angles, but you know, a lot of questions in the classroom around violence in the Bible, as mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of your listeners have, have forced me to think through them and continue to force me to think through them, including the questions I got for this interview. So I look forward to our discussion. Awesome. Thank you. Michelle, how about you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So um, I want to thank you too uh, for having me here. I'm glad we get to chat with some people. Answering questions is part of why I love doing this. I actually got into biblical studies uh, during college. I wanted to be in ministry uh, and I thought I wanted to be in youth ministry. And then I realized I wasn't actually very good with teenagers. Uh, and so uh, right around that time, I started answering a lot of questions for my classmates about scripture and about how they wanted to preach on it. And I became just like the resource on campus for people who were trying to prep their sermons and make sense of biblical passages. And I think somewhere along the way, somebody was like, I think that's what seminary professors do. And I was like, perfect, I'll do that. Uh, so um, as I was trying to decide in terms of a corpus to specialize in, uh, kind of like Matt said, it was the people around me were just mystified um, by the Old Testament. They didn't know what to do with it. It felt messy and confusing. And somewhere along that line, I realized the mess was part of the appeal of the Old Testament to me. Um, mm -hmm. It's like you get to walk around in the mess and ambiguity of life along with these characters trying to make sense of things. And that just felt so real and present and important. So I wanted to get better at doing that. And so I did. And now I teach at uh, a divinity school. I teach at uh, Trinity uh, Evangelical Divinity School. I teach Old Testament. I teach Hebrew. Uh, but my research and my canonical specialty um, is the former prophets. And so that would be Joshua Judges. Um, Samuel and Kings. Uh, so those are where I spend quite a bit of my time. And I, those are pretty messy, <laughs> pretty messy books. Uh, yeah. So I love teaching people how to kind of just 
dig into the story uh, and meet God there. Awesome. Well, we are so glad to have both of you here. I'm excited to hear you answer these questions and share all the wisdom that you have. So we're going to jump right in if you guys are ready. Um, Matt, I'm going to kind of throw this first question to you um, since it focuses on the book of Joshua, and I know that's one of your specialties. So this is what one of our um, students has asked. They said, when Rahab in Joshua 2 um, verses 8 through 13 tells the spies why she helped them, it appears that the fame of the Israelites had reached the folks in Jericho. Why do you think she decided to side with the Israelites when the rest of her people did not? Does it have to do with her status as a prostitute? And if so, why only her and not other disenfranchised people? Yeah, that was a really interesting question. I don't think I've been asked that particular question before, so it kind of forced me to think think through it a little bit. Um, I think you know it's an interesting thesis that this comes out of her status as a marginal person in the story. Um, I should just put a little footnote and say that there's a little bit of debate about um, the term prostitute and exactly how best to translate that, but let, let's go with that definite that translation of prostitute um i think you know from the story's point of view it's simply that the fame of what israel had done had reached jericho and so in it and it evoked mixed responses in the case of rahab and apparently her her family her household um she thought you, you know this not just from a strategic point of view this is important that we side with the winning side but the way the story tells it is that she was compelled she was compelled by the claim that yahweh is the true god of heaven above and the earth below and so the story wants us to see rahab as discerning rightly who yahweh is in the story now mm -hmm. what enabled her to discern that well might have been her marginality and 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 recognizing maybe some of the flaws with this kind of society fostered by a different um, di uh, like divine realm. Um, but I think that's, that's the, the, the logic and rationale that the, the stories, the story gives is about um, her response to, to Yahweh and what God had done in bringing Israel out of Egypt and what he had done in the Transjordan and so on. And really this taps into a larger theme in the book of Joshua, which is around the question of, um, how different kings and nations and peoples are going to respond to what God has done in and through Israel. And that really determines their fate in the story. Um, there's also the question, sort of a sidebar, but important one, about um, th what kind of city Jericho was. You know, if you imagine a huge urban environment with you know, thousands of people and only Rahab and Rahab alone responded positively, then mm -hmm. it's, it's like it does force the question more why this uh, anomalous character. But um, based on the best we can sort of discern, archaeologically speaking, it was probably a pretty small, um, maybe a fortress uh, at the time, largely populated by soldiers. And, you know, civilian populations probably, if they were in the city, would have skedaddled out of there with an, you know, approaching army and so on. And so, it kind of leaves the question of why was Rahab and her family still there? Were they there to quote unquote serve the troops or what? In which case, you know, she was in a very bad situation. It also taps into the theme of of women sort of discerning the dynamics of power rightly that we see in the beginning of Exodus with Shifra and Pua, the Hebrew midwives, and and um, um, Miriam and and uh, her her mother Moses' mother. Uh, and so, so this, th that theme is also present and running through this story uh, as an important piece. So yeah, I'd be curious what other people think on that question, but that's where I'd start. Yeah, I would, I would echo everything that Matt said. I think he's hit on everything um, that's so crucial about her narrative. Maybe the one other thing I would note is I think it's really helpful to remember that narratives are inherently selective. Uh, and so not only do we have the historical question of was she the only one, we also have the question of like, why did the narrator choose to tell her story and to front it and to really highlight it? 
Uh, and I think that's really interesting to think about in terms of this being the generation of faithful uh, that came uh, and got to settle in the promised land, but their parents didn't. They died in the wilderness and mm -hmm. they died in the wilderness because um, they started worshiping other gods. And at least the way that Numbers tells it, it associates them with um, with starting to marry foreign women. And there can be a misreading of that where every foreign woman is a threat. And I love that the book of Joshua is like, not this one. Uh, <laughs> in fact, you probably thought the worst of her based on the title given and a lot of other things, but her story mm -hmm. kind of breaks down a lot of really inappropriate assumptions um, mm -hmm. and kind of sets you up for the destabilizing narrative of Joshua. Mm. I, I love both of your insights. I, I never even I, I never even had heard the idea that Jericho was more of a fortress city and that possibly she and her family were essentially servicing um, the soldiers. Um, I mean, I, I do wonder about the, the, the status as a prostitute or I, I, as you were mentioning that, I know that some folks would say that she was an innkeeper, but mm -hmm. still there's that sense of she rightly discerned something about Yahweh being very different from the gods that she had been exposed to and as something about him, something about the Israelites as they're coming, I, I, I am just so intrigued that somehow she discerned it. And I love your point, Michelle, of just that there is a purpose to the narrative. And I I'd absolutely agree that there is something about the story surprises us when we read it and we're thinking, oh, the, of course, this is she's probably going to give them up. She's probably going to surrender the two spies to the, the to the king in Jericho, and instead she she shields them. She she sends the soldiers on a wild goose chase, and yeah, it, it's just it's a very surprising ending to that particular part of the story, and it really does kind of raise this hope that you don't necessarily have to be born into the Israelite family to actually know Yahweh, and, and somehow a person who is technically a Gentile can come to worship the correct God. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that to me, especially as, as a Gentile myself, this is, it's, it's hopeful, if anything. Hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, picking up on the point about, um, you know, Ray, Rahab uh, discerning who God is. Another striking thing in the story is that her, the way she talks about God sounds like she's been reading Deuteronomy. Mm. And, and, and so, um, you know, there's some crafting I'm sure by the narrator happening there, but we're, we're meant to be surprised about her on so many levels. Like, like Michelle said about, you know, a, a foreign woman, uh, could on one reading of the Pentateuch, be seen as a symbol of all that threatens Israel. And in fact, the spies are sent out from Shittim. That's right. It says in Joshua, the very the very place where they had, according to numbers, quote unquote, played the harlot with the women, the Moabite women and fallen into idolatry. So we're already on edge when we hear where they're coming from and that's evoked. And then they go right to the house of prostitutes and they don't seem to be doing a lot of spying. And so all these alarm bells are going off and then she just surprises us by, um, giving the, the most sort of faithful confession of who Yahweh is. And it's like straight up, straight out of the book of Deuteronomy. So it's, it's meant to hit us uh, in, a, in a pretty remarkable way, uh, similar to the, the woman of faith that, that, who's called a Canaanite woman in the Gospel of Matthew yeah. that Jesus encounters. And yeah. he has not seen such faith uh, even in Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where my mind went to. Glad you said mm -hmm. that. The whole time that you guys were describing her in that way, I was thinking about that story. And it just shows to me how important loyalty to Yahweh is, mm -hmm. even more so than some of the, the sins that humanity gets caught up in. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. Okay, let me um, jump to the next question um, and let's see your thoughts on this. I'm going to pitch this one to Matt um, first as well, since we're kind of living in the, the book of Joshua right now. And then Michelle, I'm going to pitch some to you after our break. 
that are going to focus on the book of Judges. So the second question um, that students wrote in says, the story of Achan is really difficult for me to swallow. Why does his sin affect all of Israel? And why does he and his children, and then in parentheses, what about his wife? Why do they have to be executed and disposed of in such a horrifying way? Yeah, this, uh, I'll just share the, um, the sense of mystification over this this issue with the the person who asked it. So I want to just um, say that this for me is in the pile of texts that I'm not really sure what to do with. So I just want to give that caveat at the front. As much as I've thought about Joshua, um, you know the the subject of corporate responsibility that mm -hmm. this topic touches on is is pretty difficult. Um, and it's not really solved for me by saying, well, in our culture, we think more individualistically about sin and responsibility. So you are responsible for your own sin, whereas in ancient cultures, they were more corporate minded. That might be a part of just understanding how an ancient reader might not have balked at this <laughs> um, story, but it still doesn't solve the ethical question for me, especially when there are other texts that seem to touch on the subject of corporate responsibility and say, no, at least in terms of intergenerational sin, each generation is held liable in their own terms. So uh, that's to just restate the problem. Um, a couple little things in the narrative itself, at least mitigate it for me or just put it in a slightly different light. Like the story starts out in Joshua 7, and it says the Israelites broke faith in regard to the devoted things. And so we're told that not just did one, not just had one person, this is somehow there's some Israelite responsibility here. Then it zooms in on the character of Achan um, and how he had took some of the devoted things. So how we understand the relationship between those clauses is not exactly explained, but it does start out with like all Israel somehow in on this. Um, and if we go back to Deuteronomic law, all Israel is held liable for these things. And in the story, as it plays out, all Israel doesn't end up um, suffering because of it. It's, well, they, they all lose the battle. So there's that. Uh, but only, what is it? Uh, 46 die, um, which again, is still a problem and a challenge. But there's something of a limiting happening uh, in this story on that front. Um, the other like little clues some people have, ha or ways people have thought about this is the way that in stories, often minor characters sort of mark collective attitudes. This is a, something that Joshua Berman talks about in an article he wrote on this passage. Um, and so th the idea being that the, the story focuses in on Aiken mm -hmm. and his family, but there, there might be something representative happening here that's not where the sin or the, the, the act of transgression was not exclusively limited to this, this one character. Um, again, that's just suggestive. I'm not really sure beyond that. Um, the other thing is that like the, is to think about the function of this story. So Michelle had mentioned earlier, we have to think, Think about why the story fronts Rahab and, mm -hmm. you know, the camera zooms in on her and we're focusing on her of all the details in the Jericho battle. Um, and she's put as this shocking uh, character in the sense that here's a Canaanite who is included in the people of God. And Achan is sort of a contrast character in the story of mm -hmm. an insider, an Israelite, who becomes devoted to destruction, to use the language of uh, Joshua, even though he's an Israelite. And in terms of the function of these two stories together, they remind us as a pair that the, the boundaries of who's in and who's out are not maybe what you initially thought when you started the book. And mm -hmm. so, Functionally, this story is designed to hit us hard with both things. Hit us hard on the one hand that 
this isn't just a, a sort of Canaanite who, you know, she's she's okay. It's, she's more faithful and Yahweh centered than any Israelite. You know, so it hits us hard on that side. Then hit hard on the other side of here's an Israelite who mm -hmm. is treated as we thought the Canaanites were supposed to be treated according to the law. So it's shocking us on that angle too. And for that reason, I think the story is meant to hit us hard and leaves us in a difficult place ethically around the idea of corporate responsibility. Um, but that's, that's something important to bear in mind about the function of these two stories together. So those are a few starting points, but I know that doesn't resolve it. Any other thoughts, you guys? No, I was just gonna, I think one of the things I really like about how Matt framed that, and Matt, you frame things uh, this way in other places you've written, but I think there's immense value in encouraging people to acknowledge that the things in these texts bother us. And I feel like there, that's not just like a, a psychological push, like there is a biblical warrant, not only to question, to say, as far as I can tell, this seems weird. Uh, there's biblical warrant uh, for characters to do that. But beyond that, God talks about not wanting anyone to perish. Like there is a biblical idea that like death is not what we were designed for. This kind of violence isn't what we were designed for. So I, I do think, and again, Matt has written on this beautifully, um, but I think there's such value in these questions being like, did that really hit you hard? Like Matt talked about, like it was what that's supposed to, that like, yeah. Mm -hmm then hurts and it doesn't just hurt you it hurts a lot of people around you and that should horrify you and i mm. think the story does that really really well yeah i i guess uh, I, I would ha almost have a question for both you know matt and michelle because one of the things that i noticed when i was reading this story is so in the niv translation it because in the esv they would translate in verse of chapter seven, they mentioned, you know, Aiken's talking and he's saying he took or plundered a, a, a beautiful robe from Shinar. That's how the ESV would translate it. But then in the NIV, they go through the trouble of actually saying that it's actually from Babylon. Yeah. And I'm wondering, it's like, because, you know, it, it, this is one of those few moments where I'm noticing like Babylon is appearing earlier than typically where I would ever think of Babylon. And I'm yeah. wondering, is that is that a hint at something like is, is there something that Aiken was desiring? Is it because of something about this robe mm -hmm. that it came from Babylon? Like, is there something going on with just that? Um, so I don't know. It's it's just a, it's a question that came in my mind because the the two translations they went to two different ways. The Shinar one I wouldn't have naturally even thought of that, but with the NIV version of using mm -hmm. Babylon, it. It's bringing up these questions that makes me wonder, well, like, why? Yeah, that's a that's a good observation. Um, the 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 link between Shinar and Babylon is is made in Genesis eleven, where humans settle in the plains of, Sh of Shinar and they build the city of Babylon and the Tower of Babylon um, back in Genesis eleven. And so, I think we are meant to think. That is an evocative phrase, what he confesses to on several fronts. One is the, that what is being prohibited here is the taking not just of goods from this random city, but of imperial wealth. Um, and what's notable, and others have pointed this out, that in the, all the battles in Joshua, they're focused on walled cities and not outlying villages. And there, there is something of a breaking of a particular kind of regime that's um, that has a hold in the land of Canaan. You know, historically speaking, Egypt is still controlling um, the more or less controlling the land of Canaan at this time. It's sort of their, their hold is slipping, but it, it's under the thumb of Egypt. And so I think we should think of these walled cities as um, Egyptian backed Canaanite warlords holding them. And, and so it, if you think of this, this sort of imperial backdrop to the book that Israel's coming and systematically dismantling, taking from that wealth has a cer certain uh, weightiness to it 
Mm-hmm. Um, in that it's not just he's greedy, he shouldn't be greedy, but he's he's bringing into Israel a kind of poison they're meant to dismantle uh, throughout the the course of the conquest. I can't remember what my second point was, but that was my first one. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Jeez. <laughs> oh, I know. I know what it was. Uh, he, he is described as like he talks about coveting and taking. Yes. And and I think we're meant to sort of make the the links back to the Pentateuch with uh, the Tenth Commandment and also mm-hmm. um, Deuteronomy 13 that talks about the fact that you shouldn't covet and take from any of the proscribed things lest you make Israel liable to destruction. So as harsh as this law is, and I sit uncomfortably with it, um, it, it is specifically mentioned in Deuteronomy 13. And, and I think that's one more way that, you know, in both the Rahab story and this story, we're meant to meditate on the Torah, which is what Joshua 1 tells us to do, or, you know, as the people should do and so it is a failure on his part to do the thing that is going to guarantee their success not military strategy but torah meditation and Mm -hmm. uh, rahab succeeds on that front Mm -hmm. and uh, achan fails and um so that's kind of the bit of the backdrop there Yeah, that's good. Okay, well, we're going to jump to a commercial break after this next question. So Matt, I'm going to pitch this one to you and just kind of give me a fast, short um, answer. And then we'll jump to a commercial break because then I want to come back and focus on judges with Michelle. So here's one final question on um, on the book of Joshua. It says in Joshua 10, Verses, 10, uh, verses 12 through 13, the NIV says Joshua spoke to the Lord, but his words in quotations has him addressing the sun and the moon. If Joshua was addressing God, why would he speak to the sun and the moon since they're obviously not God and they don't have ears? Yes. Um, <laughs> I love that question. Yeah, and, in, uh, and in the Hebrew, it is a sort of um, direct address there. So. Um, one thing I would, I would say is that, you know, throughout the Bible, um, the what we would call nature is often depicted in terms of what I would call responsiveness that exceed a purely scientific understanding of the natural world. Um, and so this, this dynamic is at play throughout Scripture and is a view that seems to be held even by God himself and by Jesus in the the gospels who talks about you know if if the um if they don't praise him the rocks will cry out or god talking about uh, abel's blood crying out from the ground which had opened its mouth to receive his uh cain's brother's blood and so um and and i think of the psalmist in psalm 148 inviting the the sun and the moon and the the sea creatures and the heavenly hosts and um, all sorts of beings to bring praise to God. So I don't think we should move from the idea that there's responsiveness to God or responsiveness to humanity in the created realm to the idea that it's therefore divinized. Um, Mar- Mari Yorstad in her, her book uh, on um, Hebrew Bible and environmental ethics or something like that, I can't remember the exact title, she talks about how um, you don't have to have a, a view of the world that it's divinized to to uh, think that it is personalistic is her terminology, but I would just say responsive. So I think mm-hmm. I think that's at play here. Um, you know, had the heavens and the earth are called as witnesses witnesses to the covenant later on. So this is a, a, a sort of pan biblical dynamic that maybe challenges some of our purely naturalistic assumptions about the created realm. Awesome. Anybody want to throw in one quick thing on that, Mike? It looked like you were about to say something. <laughs> no, I mean, I the only, I mean, I love that. I was just thinking that it, it's almost as though in that kind of ancient worldview, like all of creation was having a dialogue. Yeah, and it it, mm-hmm. it it wasn't a bad thing to actually to call them out, essentially to do something on you know at the command of of Yahweh. But mm-hmm. it, it's it's interesting. It's almost as though there has always been this sense of like a dialogue with not just with Yahweh, but 
really just that creation gets to participate in whatever form or fashion. Yeah. Yeah, that's a cool thought to think about. Well, we'll let all of our listeners just ponder that as we jump to a commercial. And then Michelle, you get ready when we come back because we've got a couple of direct questions on the book of Judges that we want you to hit. So let's jump to a quick break. If you're not already reading with us, we'd love to have you start reading today. Every month in the Awakening Bible community, we read a book or several books of the Bible together. Readings are only one to three chapters a day, five days a week, with weekends reserved for catch up or deeper study. And as you read, we know that you will likely encounter questions, but that's where we come in. Submit your questions at awkng.com and we will do our best to get them answered for you right here on the Ask a Scholar podcast. Well, welcome back, everyone. I'm super excited to jump into this next question because I feel like this is just a, especially among amongst our students, this is a question that gets thrown out there a lot in our discussion forums and our community posts, all of that. So Michelle, you're up with this one. This is the question. It says, I'm confused by Judges 2 verses 1 through 5, where the angel of the Lord appears to Israel and begins speaking as though he slash it was the Lord. Is this angel of the Lord actually God or just an angel? I mean, what a question. It's certainly a timeless one. It's one people have been trying to answer uh, for a very long time. Uh, But I'll start off by saying what's even trickier about the Hebrew is that the Hebrew word here is actually messenger, not able or or not angel. And so part of what we're trying to do in these different narratives is determine when it is very clearly um, an angel and when it is a human messenger. Uh, And most of your English translations have done that hard work already. Uh, And so here, when it says angel of the Lord, it's because the translators have made it clear to you um, that we're definitely talking about some kind of divine emissary sort of figure. Uh, And that's kind of the beginning of the way I'll answer your question. Uh, We see throughout scripture this pattern of there being messengers that come from Yahweh, um, angels that come from Yahweh, and they represent him and they speak with his authority. It's more common for uh, their speeches to start out by saying, um, thus says the Lord, like we get from the prophets or... um, you have heard it said or something like that mm. but sometimes the angels of yahweh they don't they don't have to do that they can just start talking and they use the first person uh to declare themselves to be speaking with yahweh's voice mm-hmm. so at minimum, that's what's happening here but this is actually one of the easier passages because there are other passages where sometimes it sounds like the people actually think they're talking to God, not just his messenger. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there are some times where it can get really tricky, like wrestling with Jacob can get, like, are we talking about God or are we talking about an angel? Uh, Mm -hmm. So there is this kind of sense literarily where sometimes it's a little ambiguous, but you are absolutely sure that if this isn't God walking around on earth, it is a divine emissary who perhaps looks human because sometimes they get uh, confused for humans, but they are speaking with the authority of God um, mm-hmm. as as his angel, as his representative. Um, throughout church history, some people actually um, wondered if this was like actually a theophany. Like, was this God showing up, looking like a man yeah. and walking around? And that's a possibility that we can't rule out. Um, but in this particular passage, it does sound like it is a secondary individual kind of from the way it's framed. Yeah, such a, a fascinating <laughs> subject. And yeah, I like how you, um, you know, highlight the fact this is messengers and the way they can just suddenly speak in the first person. Uh, the one the one I, I was thinking of kind of as a parallel is the burning bush episode mm-hmm. where, where it says that, uh, um, you know, in, in Exodus 3, 2, it's a Malach Adonai. So a, a messenger of Yahweh appears to, um, you know, appears in this fiery, you know, burning fire in the midst of the bush. Um, but then it's, it goes on uh, and it talks about Yahweh speaking. 
Uh, That's right. And it, then, and it also uses the word God. So you have yeah. messenger, Yahweh, God, and you're like, who is this? And, and like you mentioned, <laughs> the, Jacob, the Jacob episode yeah. where it, it says a man met him in the, in the night and wrestled him. And then he says, I saw God. And then there's that text in Hosea where Hosea is talking about it and says That's that, right. a, that a um, messenger or angel appeared to him. So it's like there's slippage between characters in these um, or that that the story is quite comfortable. I, do you think that's purposeful? Like the ambiguity is part of the point. Hmm. I would suggest, especially in Judges, that is the key, hmm. um, because we get that in Gideon. Uh, the slippage yeah. is really clear, in Gideon, because it sounds like a messenger at first, and then it's like even the narrator calls him God, and then it switches back uh, to where the one who like goes up in smoke. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, so it's yeah. like we've got a lot going on. Well, and then yeah. we, of course, have the Samson narrative where we mm. have an angel. Oh, like, that's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yes. Uh, so in all of those situations, we are supposed to hear God talking very directly. I would suggest that's part of the narrative structure of Judges is, hey, God has a message for you, and we want you to hear it with the immediacy and the urgency of God speaking to you. And part mm -hmm. of what Judges, I think, is measuring is how people handle that ambiguity. Uh, hmm. and how people handle that divine um, message. And so Gideon will meet with a messenger and then continue to have doubts, but he'll also get a dream from God. It's like God's going over and above revealing himself. Same mm -hmm. with Samson. From infancy, this person is prepared to understand God and what he's doing in his life. Uh, and yet we see him kind of failing monumentally um, mm -hmm. to pursue God's ways. And so I would suggest there's kind of this revelatory theme in Judges and how do you handle moments where you have to discern how God's talking and what you should do? And are you willing to trust his messengers? I mean, in Deuteronomy, when it talks about prophets, it says you listen to their voice and anyone who doesn't listen to their voice, you're going to have me to deal with is sort of the way the Hebrew is structured. And I think there is a sense in which when we're pretty sure these people speak for God, my goodness, you are responsible for seeing God's authority in that person. And I think that slippage provides that to contemporary readers too, which is a kindness. Yeah. Wow. The, the, the question comes up, it's, it's on the other podcast that I've been helping out, out with, with uh, Ron Johnson, uh, he and I just did essentially like a month and a half of studying like the two powers doctrine. Um, of like Alan Siegel and all the, the the works that came up afterwards with what Siegel mm -hmm. kind of stirred up. And it, it, it's interesting to kind of look back at it, it, even just um, the Second Temple period and onward into the Talmud, uh, um, the Talmud and then the Mishnah periods where you start seeing the rabbis are getting very nervous about the slippage. Mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. And and that they start trying to to create boundaries of like no this is the only way to interpret it and mm -hmm. like they, they got upset at the ideas of Yahweh is a man of war they got upset with Daniel seven they got upset about the angel of the Lord appearances in 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 in, ju in judges because it, it, it's just this ambiguity and I I love that the emphasis in the end is you're supposed to actually be listening to Yahweh anyways and however <laughs> that message is. However, that message is coming up, you're supposed to be listening and then obeying or keeping to it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Technically in the Hebrew. And, and so it, it is interesting. The slippage does allow the authority to basically take center stage. Yeah. For some reason, as the centuries have gone on, the the we got more distracted with who the heck is this? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that does have a wonderful interplay about what eventually the church would start appealing to and mm -hmm. about especially the identity of Jesus. And so I, I, I've, I've said it many times in our own podcast with, uh, with Ron that um, the ambiguity is there and we should actually just enjoy the ambiguity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, I wonder if it plays a kind of formative role that that if you know if we try to parse out exactly who this is and the clean lines of distinction between god the messenger and making sure they're always maintained or that ancient readers assume them you know if 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 clarity is part of the point like why appear to go back to the moses example 
in a burning bush that's not consumed. It's <laughs> it's it's category defying, and hmm. and category breaking, and and I think that's a, a function of coming into close encounter with a transcendent God, that that this is going to mess with your categories, and so maybe the confusion over identity you know, at the risk of overplaying it is, is part of that formative experience of encountering God that, mm -hmm. that, that prepares the ground for hearing something that might be surprising. Like I'm calling you as deliverer to go rescue um, yeah. the, the uh, Israelites. Yeah. Those are really great points. I love that perspective. Um, because there's always going to be some things in the Bible that we might never really have definitive answers for. And it's okay to kind of wrestle with it and say that I'm not quite sure. But at the same time, let's look and see what the message is that's actually being spoken to us because that's really what is most important. So I love that. I'm glad you guys pulled that out. Um, okay, Michelle, here is another question that came in. It says the singing, I'm kind of excited about this one. It's interesting to me. The singing in Judges 5 seems out of place in a book that records wars and battles. What is the significance of Deborah and Barak singing in Judges 5? Which I will say, it is kind of funny when you get to this part after you've read all these wars and all these battles, and then they launch into this song. So I'm excited to hear <laughs> you answer this one. It's like we're all yeah. singing a musical. Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, like whiplash. It's not not the kind of musical I'd like to see. <laughs> Be a pretty brutal one to witness. Uh, yes, uh, what a fascinating feature of Hebrew narrative. Because you know what? As much as it strikes us as so odd here, we see this in several other narratives in the Hebrew Bible, where we have these sort of poems that are inset in the middle of narratives. And there is this ongoing question about the way that Hebrew authors wrote, um, what, what were they doing with these different songs? Uh, here, I mean, one way we can talk about the fittingness of a song here is that victory songs are often sung after battles. We have Miriam singing, we have Moses singing after the Exodus. Um, and in both of those situations, uh, they are recounting events that we had just heard in kind of narrative and now we hear them in poetry and that's kind of a similar dynamic to what we have here and in fact we see that a little bit in other ancient near eastern writings so this wasn't just um, something that we see in the old testament uh, but maybe a kind of another way to address this question um, if we think of this not just as a victory song but as a speech by a prophet I think that adds a whole different dimension to what we're seeing mm -hmm. in Judges 5, mm -hmm. because Deborah has just been set up as um, as the woman who was judging at that time. But she is also and even before that introduced as a prophet. And she is the one that goes throughout the story saying, has not Yahweh commanded, has not Yahweh commanded, which is the way Moses used to talk. It's a yeah. standard way that prophet reminds people about the commands of Yahweh. Joshua talked that way. Um, and so, uh, though not quite as clearly. Uh, and so we have this, this, mos this, I don't, whether you want to say mosaic or not, she's certainly a prophetic figure. And she's actually the first person called a prophet since Moses promised that a prophet would appear uh, back in Deuteronomy. She's the first uh, Hebrew, the Hebrew word Navi or Navia, she's the first person that has carried that term, even though there are other people who have done prophetic things. Um, she then recounts the battle. And what we have is somebody with kind of um, divine authority, again, not her own authority, but God's authority, his insights, uh, as well as her kind of prophetic wisdom. She reflects on everything they've seen. And some of the implicit themes of the narrative then become explicit in the song in such a way that she can say, I just want to be super, super clear about what you just experienced and what you should be, uh, the way in which you should be interpreting it. Uh, and of course, the switch in genre to poetry allows her to do that in a very expressive um, and very um, kind of uh, stylistically laden and image driven kind of way. Um, mm -hmm. and one of the things we see within the Hebrew Bible, within the Old Testament, is that these songs often do that. They are often stuck in narratives to take something that the author's building implicitly and say it explicitly. Uh, and that is what I would suggest is going on here. And the fact that Barak sings with her, the fact that the general actually joined her in song, 
is a rare moment in the time of the judges where somebody actually learns something and we're able to agree with God. And so that's worthy of celebration. Hmm. Wow. I'm taking notes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did just write an entire book on this to the degree that I thought you guys planted the question. So like I could talk, I could talk about it. <laughs> oh, that's great. That was perfect then. Um, no, that is such a great answer. I'm with, I'm with you guys. I'm just processing all of that. Does anybody have any thoughts to add to that? Because I love, I just love your perspective. So, so well, Michelle, I'm, I'm just, so then I'm curious because towards the end, there's this, this little kind of mention about the mom. And, it, and that she's like wondering, oh, I'm just waiting for my son. <laughs> and and it, yeah. I always, I always had just took that as, you know, it's, it's evoking emotion, but I, I didn't necessarily think because it's a song, maybe it's just like, if, you know, fanciful imagination, it, it, it did, it didn't happen. But now I'm wondering if this is actually more of a prophetic speech. Mm -hmm. Is it that, is it possible then in that kind of perspective that Deborah is actually accessing something that she normally would not have been able to know to know and that's certainly possible I mean she she condemns particular tribes and she's able to name kind of their motivations or lack of motivations so that would suggest mm -hmm. that she knows that you know by God's directive she has some kind of clarity um, but I think one of the things I would highlight about that um, that vignette featuring Cicero's family is it makes a nice pairing with the vignette right before it where JL is described um, in her encounter with Cicero. And often I explain to students that I think what's happening there with Cicero's family is you get kind of an insight into what is expected socially. How should this have gone down? And it's set right next to how it really went down in the tent of JL. And it provides this insane contrast, kind of the same kind of destabilizing contrast we saw with Rahab, what were social expectations and what actually mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. And when Sisera's family, they're uh, like, they're sitting behind lattice or some kind of window, they're in a building compared to JL who's in a tent. Uh, and so there's already this, um, uh, this disparity uh, in kind of socioeconomic uh, realities and vulnerability. And then she goes on to say, I'm expecting him to come home with a womb or two, which is a pretty crass way to talk about female prisoners of war. Um, and so we now have an idea of what we should have expected to happen to jail, but that's the exact opposite of what happened to jail. In fact, jail was unexpectedly the conqueror in that situation. She was unarmed. She wasn't Israelite. She wasn't part of the army. She was in a tent. And she actually was victorious over someone the Israelite army was unable to be victorious over to the same degree. Uh, and so at the end of the day, meeting Sisera's family provides us the kind of cultural backdrop we need to understand the significance of JL's actions. Hmm. Yeah, I think I think the your point about this song picking up on some of the key themes in the book is is really important and and the fact that it's cast in a song I, I would think it sort of facilitates its recitation and remembrance by the people uh, assuming it had some sort of tune that went with it right so yeah. and I, th I think of um, the way that biblical stories take things that might otherwise pass us by or be seen as as anomalous or marginal and moves them into the center and facilitates their remembrance. And it's, you know, that does provide a good analogy with, with Joshua and Rahab, where, you know, this, this seemingly marginal character then becomes the, the sort of main first story we're hit with as we retell this book and, and recount it. Um, yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Well, and that way, then it's a little bit like Deuteronomy 32, where Moses said, mm -hmm. learn this song, you're actually going to be able to remember it. So I think that lends credence to Matt's observation. Mm -hmm. Mike, any last thoughts? No, I, I'm, just I'm just speechless. I, I, I might want to break out into song, but like I, <laughs> I'm just like, wow. 
Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you guys for your wisdom and for um, just taking the time to answer these questions. We're going to wrap up this episode and i know you guys are going to join us again for a second episode because we've got several other questions on both joshua and judges that we need you to hit but as we close i did want to just quickly ask um, are there any resources that you've recently come out with or like you said that you've written in the past that you would like to share with the audience so that they can grab a hold of some of these deeper um, studies and and books that you've authored well since we were just there i'll mention um I have a book coming out called The Prophet's Anthem, and it's about Judges 5 and its function in the book of Judges, and it comes out October 31st. So okay, if awesome. that answer was interesting, you've got plenty more pages where that came from. Okay, great. Can they pre-order that somewhere? I'm sure they could. Yes, I believe it's on Amazon and on Baylor's website. Okay, okay, right. great. Matt, anything for you? Any resources you'd like to direct listeners to? So I, I wrote on the subject of violence in the Old Testament, specifically taking up the story of the flood in Genesis and Joshua in a book I wrote called uh, Flood and Fury, and that's published with IVP Academic. Okay, great. Where can they find that? Uh, on the interwebs. So you can go to <laughs> Amazon. You can go to Amazon.de. Okay. Or .com. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, I'm sure if they if they look up y'all's names, I'll find it. Um, let me ask you guys one fun little question. We like to end every podcast with a fun question after we've used our brain um, to dive into hard topics. So your fun question for today is your favorite thing to do on your day off. And Michelle, I'm going to have you go first. I like to sit on my front porch uh, sort of endlessly and drink a latte. Mm, I love that. Sounds relaxing. <laughs> Yeah. Matt, how about you? So we live near uh, a park here in Vancouver called Spe uh, Specific. It's Pacific uh, Spirit <laughs> Park. I can't talk. Uh, Pacific Spirit Park. It's it's almost rainforesty, and mm. it's just so gorgeous. Um, big Douglas fir trees and uh, a beautiful place to walk. Really big and spacious. So uh, my wife and I uh, sometimes our kids like to walk in there. Mm, that sounds nice. Awesome. Okay, great. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. And we're excited to have you back on this next episode. For all those listening, thank you for taking time out of your busy day to listen to this. We hope it was encouragement to you. We hope that it answered some really interesting questions in these books. And we hope that you'll join us again. Make sure you um, like, share, subscribe, leave us a review. All those things help us. And we will see you again next time. If you're enjoying the Ask a Scholar podcast, Click follow on your podcast listening app to subscribe. Want to help further our mission? Consider becoming a monthly partner at awkng.com and help us make an impact in the lives of others all around the world as we work to make biblical understanding accessible to all with no exceptions. Join us next time as we get more of your Bible questions answered. And don't forget to visit awkng.com to engage in all our biblical resources that we offer.